work at Cumulus Networks and um, uh, just for some context, um, Cumulus is a distribution running on network switches. So all the examples um, and configuration are from switches, but uh, we run the Linux bridge on switches and this can be applied to hypervisors or servers and so on. Um, before I start, the last time I did a tutorial at NetDev, I had very few slides and I was done in 20 minutes and I I'm afraid I overworked this time and I have too many slides. <laughs> so I'm going to zip through some of the basic slides that I've put in there, mainly for documentation. Um, yeah, I apologize if it can make you dizzy. Uh, I will skip through some basic slides. So eVPN, eVPN, I, want, I do want to mention, this is not IPsec VPNs, this is Ethernet VPNs. So everything here, what I'm going to talk about is pure layer two networks. And I do want to say that, um, so I, I and there is another person, Nikolai, who's a bridge expert who, at Cumulus, who work on all these technologies. So this tutorial um, is again, uh, it's talking about deploying Linux bridge in the data center, uh, VXLAN tunnel endpoints uh, for overlay, for stretching L2 networks across data centers or across racks or pods. Ethernet VPNs. Ethernet VPN is a very hot technology in the networking, data center networking industry today. It's basically using BGP, the routing protocol, to um, for network virtualization overlays. So uh, this is a, just a check for me. Uh, I'm doing this tutorial mainly to give some perspective on all the work that we've been doing in the kernel, in bridge and VXLAN, and so on. Um, focusing on some use cases, and most of these examples are from a Tor switch. So I, to cover a lot of basics, to build up the flow for this tutorial, I have tried to explain data center networks, then I go into Linux Bridge, and a little bit of overlay networks, um, then using Linux Bridge with VXLAN, and eVPN, and then Linux Bridge with eVPN. So data center network basics. I think um, I attended Jamal's talk yesterday and he did cover a bit of uh, pods and racks and so on in the data center. So yeah, so data center networks, you have racks of servers grouped into pods. I will show a picture in a minute. VLANs and subnets stretched across racks or pods. And sometimes these days, uh, layer two networks are stretched across data centers because of uh, companies merging and different administrative domains merging and so on. Um, so there are three types. Layer two, you can have a data center network that's completely layer two, VLANs everywhere, VLANs trunked everywhere. It's not a very <laughs> optimal design, but there are cases where people deploy it that way. Hybrid is a li layer two and layer three, and layer three only data center is all routing. and. Everybody wants to move to a layer three because uh, layer three data center, because of its advantages, layer two networks with STP loops, it's not very, um, yeah, not very interesting anymore. So modern data center networks are use the clause topology and it's usually layer three or um, layer two and layer three hybrid networks. So this is an example. Um, I know Jamal had a similar slide. So racks of servers connected by top of the rack switches, which are also called leaf switches. And you can, you can have another tier, another layer of switches in between, but this is the simplest uh, flat uh, uh, folded class topology. Leafs don't, leaf switches or tor switches are not connected to each other. They're all g going through the spine. Hybrid. Um, so in a hybrid model, so the servers, the servers all are running layer two, VLANs, and they use the TOR as a gateway to the layer three network. So from the TOR and above, you're basically running routing demons and uh, like BGP, and it's all layer three. Layer three only data center, you're doing routing everywhere. There's no VLANs. Um, you're running L3 from these hypervisor or servers um, up to spine and the whole data center. So layer two gateways with uh, Linux bridge. 
So layer two gateways are nothing but a rack of servers, servers running VLANs, and they're um, with VMs communicating through the, through the TOR switch, and your TOR switch it becomes your layer two gateway. So you bridge between VLANs on the servers in the same rack through your gateway switch. So to build a layer two, network, uh, layer two um, uh, gateway with the Linux bridge, you just need a Linux bridge with switch ports. You can connect all your switch ports as bridge ports. Bridging um, the bridge driver, the Linux bridge driver actually supports two modes. One is the VLAN filtering and non-VLAN uh, filtering mode. So the VLAN filtering mode is the more modern, more scalable mode. I'll just tell you why in a minute. Um, this is another basic slide showing example of a non-VLAN filtering bridge and VLAN filtering bridge. In a non-VLAN filtering bridge, um, the bridge driver does not really understand VLANs, so you do uh, put uh, VLAN devices inside the bridge. And the VLAN filtering bridge, the bridge driver understands VLAN, so you can actually tell, you can use the bridge command, the IP route to bridge uh, command in Netlink uh, API to configure VLANs on the bridge. So that was uh, switching within a VLAN and uh, routing between VLANs is done. Um, the difference here is for the VLAN filtering bridge for routing uh, between VLANs, you create a VLAN device on top of the bridge. Yeah, these are some minor details which uh, they're not documented everywhere. So I'm hoping that this tutorial slides will actually uh, help with some of this config. Scaling with Linux Bridge. So the VLAN filtering bridge was mainly done for scaling uh, because, uh, yeah, scaling net devices. Uh, the lesser net devices, number of net devices you have, the better. Uh, obviously, for many reasons, you, you'll get lesser notifications from the kernel. Overall, it's an uh, easier problem, um, easier thing to manage. So as you can see, if you are deploying 2,000 VLANs on a 32-port uh, bridge, you can end up with a lot of um, net devices with the old model, the non-VLAN filtering bridge. And the VLAN filtering bridge actually reduces that to a very small number. So this is a, a simple example, a beginner example to showing where your VMs are um, on the racks and the tor, the green boxes, uh, the leaf switches are your tor switches and that's where your bridge is running. And uh, this example is showing a VLAN filtering bridge. So there is a VLAN device on top of the bridge for every VLAN that you want to uh, switch between. And, and yeah, that's, this is a simple layer to uh, network. So, and bridge, the Linux bridge has a lot of features. Uh, Every feature that you need in a data center, like IGMP snooping, learning, um, yeah, selective control of a lot of flags of flooding and so on, you can use this. And it bridge al also support uh, supported our proxy for a long time. And recently, with new patches, uh, it supports both ARP and ND proxying. I this the use case for this uh, will be apparent in the next uh, few slides. And it supports STP, it supports STP in kernel mode and also in user space. So the rest of this tutorial, will, uh, the examples only use VLAN filtering bridge for simplicity. Overlay networks. So overlay networks are basically, uh, they are required to provide network virtualization services for tenant systems and your tenant systems are nothing but VMs. Um, what overlay networks do is they transport or they stretch your layer two network by using layer three. Um, again, this is a basic slide in network virtualization. NVE is the network virtualization endpoint. It's like the entry point into your overlay network. For example, a VXLAN driver, wherever you put your VXLAN driver, that becomes your NVE. It encaps and decaps your um, uh, packets from tenant <laughs> systems, VMs or containers into the overlay. NVE types, um, there is layer two and layer three. Uh, layer two basically provides uh, 
L2 virtualization service and L3, uh, L3 NB provides an L3 virtualization service. For this tutorial, only layer two is the focus. This is a sample picture. Uh, basically, your TS, your tenant system is a VM connected to an NBE, which is doing your VXLAN and cap DCAP. And that is transported over a L3 underlay network. So again, why overlay networks? It's basically isolation between tenant systems, VMs, customer systems, um, important in cloud environments. Stretching layer two across racks or pods in the data center. Um, like I showed in the previous picture, racks, between racks, if you want to move a VM and you want to maintain, uh, you want the VM to maintain its IP and Mac uh, after VM mobility, you would use an overlay network to stretch uh, the VM's layer two network to the other, other pods or other racks. And again, L3 networks are the best. Uh, overlay networks basically try not to proliferate your L2 network throughout the data center. You end up um, putting your L2 uh, network onto L3 so that um, you get the benefits of the L3 networks. NV deployment options. Um, the NV is again the network virtualization endpoint. The deployment option is uh, one common thing is you can put it on the hypervisor. Um, the container or uh, VMs are directly converted, directly talk to an NVE. They are mapped. Each tenant system is mapped to a VNI, for example. And, or it could be a top of the rack switch. The reason why you would choose one or the other, um, so VXLAN tunnel endpoints on the server, you can map the VM to an overlay uh, network identity like VXLAN ID at the hypervisor. So you don't need another layer of translation. Works very well in a pure L3 data center. You can, um, you don't have to stretch your uh, L2 further up the rack. Um, but the disadvantage is you'll have to do uh, VXLAN NCAP and DCAP on the, in software on the server. Um, but if you move that to the TOR, many of these TOR switches have ASICs that can do NCAP and DCAP at line rate. And that's the reason you would move the NV to the TOR switch. Now, um, what, it mean, what it also means is if you're moving the NV to the TOR, it means that the tenant system mapping needs to happen on the, um, on the TOR switch to the VNI. And this is usually done by deploying VLANs on the servers or hypervisors. Each VM is mapped to a VLAN uh, and so on. And at the TOR switch, you do a VLAN to a VNI translation. And um, yes, VXLAN, uh, as, as you know, it's, uh, it uses a VNI as the ID, tunnel ID. <coughs> VXLAN tunnel endpoints are basically used to NCAP and DCAP VXLAN uh, packets. VTAPs, um, every tunnel endpoint which NCAPs has its own routable IP address and that's how um, a VTAPs communicate uh, over the underlay and they DCAP and go to the uh, other side. In Linux has a VXLAN driver, um, as you all know. <coughs> Now here, this is a pictorial representation of what I was trying to say. Uh, VTAPs, the v VXLAN tunnel <laughs> endpoints can be on the server or they could be on the, to uh, on the TOR. So usually uh, when the layer two is terminated on the server, in this case where VTAPs are on the hypervisor, your TOR becomes just an L3 gateway routing between the VTAPs. The VXLAN tunnel endpoint could also be on the TOR, when it's on the TOR switch, you're doing VLANs on the hypervisor, you're stretching the VLANs from the hypervisor to the TOR switch, and your TOR switch becomes a layer two gateway, overlay gateway to route packets between uh, VTAPs. This is another thing showing um, the same thing. Uh, tenant systems are directly mapped to VNI. Uh, uh, that is done by the VXLAN driver. 
the star switch becomes the L3 gateway, and then you're doing uh, VXLAN on the underlay. The other model is um, VLANs to VNI. And yeah, and you use the Linux bridge. The Linux bridge does, uh, understands VLANs. And uh, I'll explain in a bit how it can translate or how it can forward to a VXLAN device. So learning. Overlay networks are stretched L2 networks across uh, racks and uh, pods. One, by default, if you don't have a controller, you usually flood and learn. Control plane learning is uh, where you have a control plane or a controller trying to uh, disseminate endpoint address mappings, MAC IP or just MAC addresses to other VTEPs. Typically done by a controller um, and static, uh, there are also solutions where you can configure uh, static MACs. You know all the VMs where they reside and you configure the VM MACs on every, uh, every VTEP or every TOR switch. So, you do this because you want to avoid flooding and learning. And uh, one characteristic of a layer two networks is you flood and that, that is bad. And especially when you're stretching your L2 network across the data center, uh, yeah, that can, that can uh, lead to a lot of wasted bandwidth. So this is a model how you deploy um, L2 overlay gateway uh, on Linux. So the Linux bridge has its FTP table and uh, you uh, uh, enslave VXLAN ports to it. VXLAN driver also maintains an FTP table. And the, v the tunnel, uh, so this just uses abstract terms. The tunnel driver um, basically maintains and forwarding database uh, with additional information, additional reachability information about um, yeah, the remote VTEPs. Where the, where the other uh, Macs live. Um, this shows a specific example of bridge and a VXLAN FTB. Uh, the key thing here is, uh, as you see, the bridge FTB points to the VXLAN port and the VXLAN FTB points the same Mac, uh, has the same Mac pointing to the remote uh, IP address where the Mac lives. So broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast traffic. Uh, this is basically, this is the thing that results in flooding of traffic in layer two networks. And uh, uh, like I said, this is aggravated when L2 networks are stretched um, across data centers. Various optimizations uh, can be done in such networks, which, which will become apparent when I talk about Ethernet VPNs. So bridge uh, driver, so you could, uh, stop flooding by just dropping packets. If you know where all your VMs live and you program all your VXLAN and uh, VTEPs uh, on every TOR switch, you could actually uh, control or uh, bridge flooding. So bridge driver has knobs for each one of them, broadcast unknown, unicast, and multicast traffic. VXLAN driver also has uh, its own mechanisms uh, to avoid flooding. So one is multicast. By default, you can configure uh, the Linux VXLAN driver to use a multicast uh, IP address so that these uh, broadcast packets or flooding happens only on that multicast group. Head-end replication is uh, where you tell, you install a default FTB forwarding database entry into the VXLAN driver FTB table, telling it to only send um, your unknown unicast or broadcast traffic to a certain VTEP list. Um, flooding is again, it's a default um, option. So VXLAN, VXLAN net devs, um, there are two, two ways you can deploy. You can have a VXLAN device per VNI, and VNI, you can scale VNI to a large number. And so deploying, for example, some of these data center deployments, they have uh, 10,000 uh, VNIs, and having 10,000 net devs does not scale well. So in recent kernels, uh, support uh, having a single VXLAN net dev, uh, which, is, which uses the lightweight 
uh, tunnel metadata um, objects. So the difference between the two is uh, the first one where you use a single VXLAN netdev for every VNI. That VNI or the VXLAN device stores an FTP table for just that VNI. The FTP is hashed by Mac. Recent kernels uh, support uh, a single uh, forwarding database uh, for all the VNIs. The FTP tables are hashed with Mac and VNI. This is uh, similar to the bridge understanding VLANs, uh, a single, single bridge understanding all the VLANs. Um, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, this I got this in, in 413 kernel. Um, Okay, now this is getting into the details of how you configure such devices. VXLAN tunnel net devs for NCAP and DCAP, enslaving into the bridge port. Um, so the next few slides have exact commands. Uh, I don't think I'm going to read through all the commands, but this is uh, something for reference later. The first one shows you how you create a VX, one VXLAN net dev per VNI. You create your net devs, you create your VXLAN, you create your bridge, um, enslave your VXLAN ports, which are called remote ports here, and the local ports, the local ports which are connected to the servers. You configure VLAN filtering. Um, like I said in my previous uh, slides, I'll be only using a VLAN filtering example. You configure VLANs using bridge VLAN. Add your, de assuming, and this assumes you don't have a controller, so you add your default FTB entries to tell the VXLAN driver to flood your unknown traffic to these particular remote destinations. So here's how it all looks. So the TAR switches have bridge and the VXLAN net devs enslaved. The spine switches, the spine switches are completely uh, L3. They only see the encapsulated VXLAN packets. The leaf switches are the ones that um, see the, um, the local traffic from each servers, like for example, VM1. If VM1 wants to talk to VM2 in this example, VM1 uh, the br uh, goes to the bridge on the TAR switch and the bridge bridges it to the VXLAN uh, device. The reason it does that is because it finds a MAC address pointing to the VXLAN device. And then the VXLAN device from there, uh, it knows that, that that particular VM is on VTEP, say, 10.1.1.2. That's a middle rack. And it encapsulates the packet and sends it. And then after that, the packet travels actually through the spine switch, uh, completely L3. This is, again, a detailed example of how you configure this. Uh, bridge VLAN shows the command to see your VLANs. Uh, the key thing here is the VXLAN, on the VXLAN device, you configure the VLAN that it is supposed to map to. For example, in this, uh, in this example, it's VLAN 10 maps to VNI 10. So if you see the bridge configuration, it's going to show you VLAN 10 configured on both of these ports. In addition, you also see that the VLAN on VXLAN 10 is also, ha it also has the egress untagged, PVID egress untagged flag, which means that if it's getting a tagged packet, uh, a packet tagged with VLAN 10, it's always going to strip it and forward it, it, forward it to the VXLAN device. It's not going to forward any other traffic, any other VLAN traffic to that VXLAN device. The FTP tables. Again, the bridge FTP table for the remote MAC. MAC2 was on, tor on rack 2. MAC2 points to the VXLAN device. VXLAN, in turn, points to the VTEP that uh, is on the middle rack. To check your running kernel state, um, you have uh, many commands, IP link show, bridge VLAN show, or bridge FTP show. To check the flags on your bridge ports, you can use IP link show. The single VXLAN net dev, it uses the uses similar configuration, except that now you create a single v, uh, VXLAN device. And 
In addition to that, what you do is you configure a mode on the bridge um, ports. It's called, I, I thought I had an hour. <laughs> okay, so, um, so the tunnel mode, um, it's called VLAN tunnel. Um, and these patches actually, the IP route two patches went in very late. Um, thanks to Steven, actually, he took it in right before the tutorial. So they must be in his net next tree. So you configure VLANs, and the, in addition, since now you have a VXLAN, single VXLAN device, you have to map the VLAN to VNI. So you have a new command um, or new option uh, to bridge VLAN to also map the tunnel ID. So this, in this model, you have very few net devs. You have only single VXLAN device, but your FTP table, um, you have a single VXLAN device for FTP table for all VNIs. Again, this looks like this. Uh, it's, it's the same thing. It's just that now you have a single VXLAN device called VXLAN zero. All the bridge uh, remote entries, remote max are pointing to that. Uh, VXLAN and the VXLAN driver knows exactly which VLAN maps to which uh, tunnel ID and it will do the translation. Uh, the key thing here, different from the previous slide, is now since you, uh, the t you are mapping the tunnel ID to, uh, um, sorry, VLAN to tunnel ID, the bridge is going to do the translation and um, yeah, it's going to, s you don't have the egress, uh, PVID egress untagged for VLAN 10 on the VXLAN device. I think I have a typo there. It should be VXLAN 0. I'll fix it. Um, this, this is another, these are again examples showing um, the output from the commands. Um, other networking technologies, yeah, you can use VXLAN, you can use Geneve or NVGRE in the same model. Uh, I have not tried that. And uh, yeah, the next note was for Tom Herbert, if he was here, <laughs> uh, he would say, he would tell everybody to move to IPv6 networks and just do uh, native, uh, use native ILA to do uh, native uh, network virtualization. So summary, uh, flood and learn by default, you need a controller to uh, make these networks efficient, that is distribute these MAC addresses on every VTAPS so that they're reachable. Distributed controllers win over centralized controllers for obvious reasons. Many controller solutions available, some of them are proprietary. Need for an open standards-based controller and that takes us to the next topic of this tutorial, eVPN. So what are Ethernet VPNs? Um, so Ethernet VPN, like I said, this is not IPsec uh, VPNs. These are VPNs to just provide isolation. And they are um, a form of layer two VPNs. And layer two VPNs are nothing but, uh, again, providing isolation, usually deployed in service provider networks to isolate customer information or customer tenant uh, um, VLANs and so on. S there is something called VPLS, and I know on NetDev there has been recent uh, chatter about VPLS. VPLS used to be the L2 VPN technology service providers and everybody used, but it had some um, disadvantages, and that's why the new standard is eVPN and everybody's moving to eVPN. So I've put some pointers to a lot of RFCs um, in the references section. Um, okay, and eVPN. So VPLS used MPLS labels to separate tenants. Um, each customer gets a MPLS label and that's how you encapsulate traffic and uh, send it across a service provider network. Now the RFC, the original RFC was written for MPLS BGP based Ethernet VPN. Um, and that's the reference to the RFC. Why eVPN? Again, overcomes some L2 VPN technology limitations, um, multi homing redundancy. There is lots of literature on the net about this. 
Control plane learning. Uh, the main thing is you do not want to flood. You want a control plane to distribute your max across your L2, stretched L2 network. EVPN is capable of supporting uh, multiple encapsulations. VXLAN is one of them. Um, and there are multiple sub RFCs doing many optimizations. They're still coming out. There are many recent uh, RFCs as well to do some optimizations um, in these areas. So again, the same thing. Uh, EVPN used to be an L2 VPN provider service uh, technology. It's being used in the data centers for network virtualization to stretch L2 networks. It's, you can also use it as a data center interconnect. Data center interconnect is nothing but connecting your data centers uh, to stretch your L2 networks um, across data centers. So, and I think I have not highlighted enough, uh, the whole EVPN angle is using BGP. Uh, BGP is a border gateway protocol. Uh, it's your usual routing protocol uh, which you use uh, for layer three networks. So with this, with EVPN, you're using, you're, you will be using BGP for layer two networks as well. Uh, that's the whole idea. So it, BGP acts as a distributed controller for your network virtualization solution. And uh, there is a specific RFC, EVPN RFC, which states that you, uh, which is adopted for VXLAN overlays in the data center. And that's the pointer to the RFC. This is just a little information about BGP. As you know, if you're running any BGP implementation on Linux, it's basically distributing routes, uh, talking to, to its peers, distributing routes. And it has a routing database, which is called as RIB. And it tr uh, installs uh, routes in the kernel, resol resolved routes in the kernel, which uh, end up becoming the FIB routes. And with the EVPN, now BGP is not only looking at your routing table. BGP will start looking at your bridge, bridge driver FTP database, VXLAN driver FTP database, and so on. So how do you deploy EVPN with BGP? BGP, you run the BGP routing protocol on every BTAP, which is a VXLAN tunnel endpoint node. Each BGP EVPN instance on each VTAP, they pair with each other. They exchange local MACs, um, which they have learned from some mechanism. The bridge, bridge does learning, and these are picked up by BGP, and they're uh, d distributed to other peers. So what else does BGP do? Um, BGP learns um, the VNIs that are configured, VLAN to VNI mappings, it tracks MAC address moves for faster convergence. It knows if a MAC address is moved and it withdraws a MAC addresses, just like exactly how it does with routes. Um, and there's something called route types. Uh, and BGP can uh, dis distribute only, um, sorry, only MACs or MAC and IP combinations. And the broadcast un unknown, uh, unknown unicast replication list is also configured by BGP. So in this uh, tutorial, the examples uh, show only um, configs from TOR switches. But there is no reason you cannot run eVPN on a host um, or a hypervisor. Um, I'm pretty sure even Cumulus has put out some documentation on this. Uh, on running it on the on the host. So here's the little algorithm that runs. So your lead switches or the TOR switches, you have the bridge, uh, the local ports, the SWP1 say, it's connected to the local rack. The VXLAN port is um, assumed that it is talking to every other VTAP on every other uh, lead switch. BGP is the uh, routing daemon that's running on each of these VTIPs. That's the additional uh, thing in this picture. So BGP discovers, I'm just going to read through the points there. BGP discovers the local VNI and VLAN mappings. It reads the uh, bridge FDB table. 
uh, distributes them to other VP, uh, eVPN peers. It learns remote Mac VN, uh, VNI entries from other VP, eVPN instances and installs it in the local bridge table for forwarding. Um, so now, because of BGP moving Max or installing Max into the kernel, remote Max into the kernel, the kernel knows exactly where to send, and it will not flood. That's the whole idea behind running BGP and having it install um, all the Max or Max of all the VMs in the data center. So ARP and ND suppression. Uh, there is another RFC, specific RFC address to this, and uh, this is the recent patch uh, which was accepted in the kernel. Uh, a, it's a bridge port flag called nay suppress, <coughs> neighbor suppress. Basically, um, since BGP knows uh, all the Macs and IPs of all the VMs in the data center, it could potentially install all of them into the kernel and have the kernel database ready for the bridge driver to actually proxy ARP and ND traffic. So as you know, ARP and ND traffic are broadcast traffic and you want to avoid them to be flooded throughout your uh, spines and L3 network. So you want to avoid that, and since you know every uh, VM that resides in the data center, you can make the bridge, uh, bridge driver proxy for it. And uh, yeah, this should be in 415 kernel, I think. So the way it can this, uh, to put all this together as a solution, um, so you can have a local snooper process. I think I will just switch to the picture. So you can have a local snooper process running on your tar switch, which snoops all the uh, packets from your local rack switches, local rack VMs, because VMs are sending guard packets, um, which you can learn from. So you can have a local snooper process. That's what actually our Cumulus solution does too. It learns the MAC IP of all your local VMs and it's gonna install it in, in the bridge, uh, sorry, in the neighbor table, in the kernel neighbor table. The B BGP is gonna pick them up. Uh, again, this is via Netlink, Netlink notifications. It picks them up, it sends them across to the other BGP instance, eVPN instance. So that way everybody knows about every other VM MAC IP. And so now, if a particular VM is trying, for example, say VM1 is trying to ARP for VM2, instead of flooding all the ARP packets through the spine, the bridge driver is going to intercept that ARP packet, um, and it's going to check that it knows this ma uh, MAC and IP um, binding in its neighbor table and it's going to respond. It'll respond to that particular ARP uh, message, ARP or neighbor discovery message. And this is part of the ARP, it's called ARP or neighbor, or ARP or neighbor proxy. The next few slides are just showing an example. Um, there is an example FRR config. FRR is uh, a routing daemon implementation. Um, if you all know Quagga, Quagga is the parent uh, of FRR. Uh, Quagga was recently forked. Um, it's called free range routing. Um, there is a pointer to its implementation. The, um, so that has an eVPN um, uh, implementation contributed by Cumulus. And um, yeah, it understands all the bridge, uh, neighbor, and routing netlink uh, information uh, from the kernel and is capable of uh, doing this. So we do use, um, we override the NT NTFEXT learnt flag, which is a bridge flag, or sorry, FTB entry or NAY entry flag to indicate that this is an externally learnt um, entry. This is also used by switch dev to indicate um, hardware learned entries. So we use the same flag, actually BGP uses the same flag to indicate that this is a remote entry that I have learned from the eVPN peer. 
So the example, I don't cover both uh, single VXLAN and multiple VXLAN devices. This example is, to keep it simple, just a single VXLAN instance. Uh, I've also put an example, uh, IFF down 2 example. IFF down 2 is a network interface manager. I've talked about it in previous NetDevs. Um, yeah, there is a pointer to simpler configuration. Instead of using IP link directly, you can uh, use a templatized or file format configuration. Uh, in interest of time, I'm going to rush through these slides. Uh, the yeah, this eVPN specific config, what you want to do in such networks is you want to turn off learning because you know that BGP is going to learn for you. Uh, the remote, uh, remote uh, Max especially, so you turn off learning on the VXLAN port, the tunnel ports. And yeah, you can turn off flooding if you, so since ARP and ND can be proxied, you can completely turn off flooding. Uh, how to check the config? This is, you can use the bridge and IP commands from IP route 2. This is a snapshot of the config. Troubleshooting and debugging. So yeah, I've been spending a lot of time debugging such networks these days, so it, is, it can be a pain. Now you have uh, FTB or MAC addresses learned by uh, hardware appearing in the kernel. These could be um, bridge driver itself learning uh, through packets, data path. Or now there's also BGP who is learning from remote entities and trying to program a entry into the kernel. The typical problems in such cases is what happens when a VM moves from one rack to the other. So you, BGP, until um, BGP has to come in, it has to learn via data path, see, see that the Mac moves, it has to communicate to the other BGP instance and update the kernel with the right flags. And when all these things are in play and packets are flying through all these leaves and so on, it's, it's it can be a pain to debug how a particular bridge or VXLAN FTB entry got modified. Um, net, Netlink notifications are um, good, but then they don't tell you who exactly did the change. So yeah, there are a couple of things that one can use. Uh, bridge FTB show, bridge uh, monitor link and monitor FTB. And uh, recently, uh, I've added trace points for bridge. These, these can be really helpful to tell you which exact process actually tried to change your FTP entry, whether it was due to a remote learn or a local learn or your local snooper process trying to. And most of these problems are due to VMs moving between racks. Uh, the thing still in the works is uh, perf probes for VXLAN driver uh, for the same thing. VXLAN FTP. And then references. There are tons of them, and these RFCs refer to many more RFCs. So, FRR, uh, there is a webinar uh, on eVPN, which is, which is very useful. And uh, yeah, BGP config, I, I don't think I want to get into BGP config. BGP config can uh, itself be a tutorial. Uh, but this is just an example if anybody wants to try. And this is the config. If you don't want to use directly IP route 2, this is another way using IFF down 2 to config. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Any questions? Um, <coughs> about the snooping um, process, is it part of FRR? Is it part of FRR? No. It, today it's not. Um, you can use a, so we have a simple process that actually listens to our packets and uh, GARP packets and adds the NAE entry. It's very trivial to add. Um, but yeah, it's not part of FRR. It could be part of FRR in the future. S so this process is not yet available as a open source on Git. 
Sorry? I, so is this uh, process available as open source on Git uh, somewhere? Today it's not, but I don't see a reason why it can't be. So we can we can put some examples out on GitHub. Um, mm. It's a very simple ARP snooper uh, process. Yeah, no, it's listening to packets actually. Packets. packets, yeah. So you open a socket and listen to GARP packets, ARP uh, on protocol. Um, if you can share your email ID, I can share share code until it goes on GitHub. But so it's I, um, I, okay, thanks. But uh, is this RDF uh, no, that's that's slightly different. Um, but that is available. Yes, that's true. That's available. Yeah. So thank you very much for trying to explain a very difficult topic <laughs> to people. <laughs> um, one thing, thinking back, is to put this in context, this is like the modern replacement for two technologies that have pretty much died, which is Trill and 802 yes. Shortest Path Bridging. Yes. And both of those were mired in vendor proprietary and complexity. And the one thing they did that this doesn't do is you were actually able to multipath. Yes. Because this is a basically a layer two overlay over layer three. The layer three substrate can't do any per flow things on the L2 packets. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering, have you gotten any, am I right in assuming that Trill and 802 shortest path bridging are both dead or are have you, got, or have you so. gotten lots of requests for them? And no, we don't have. Okay. Actually one of the authors of Trill works at Q it works at Cumulus, and we have already warned about it. Yeah, okay. It, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. it's dead. Yeah. I mean, periodically I've seen Trill fly by and then die. <laughs> Nobody ever goes anywhere with it, so. Yeah. So, so um, there's a third technology that's alive, but Rupa mentioned, which is interesting, which is uh, controllerless L2. Uh, network stretching, right? I mean, basically you've eliminated, and as you said, instead of having vendor proprietary, or if not proprietary, but solution-specific ways in which to bridge the and stitch these networks, eVPN gives you a standardized, and BGP is running anywhere in your substrate. For the multipathing case, by the way, multi VXLAN ECMP is something that will solve the problem, because you will get the underlay network now aware of the overlays, flows, and and steer. So it will address some of the concerns. It will you will still not get end-to-end multipath because L2 cannot be multipath to begin with. 